if your FTP is not approved on the other portal, maybe, or I'm sure that the certificate will not be given to you. So you are suggested that once uh, you should check and confirm that your FTP is approved, you are eligible for the certificate then only. That is 80% attendance, 60% marks in the quiz should be there, and then we will be having a final completion of this course. So uh, let's begin the session for the day. Day three, the session seven, we have with us Mr. Vidit Bhatia. So we are fortunate to have with uh, us a uh, user. Welcome to the session of AICT sponsored scheme of faculty development program. To hand over the session to Mr. Vidit, I wish to give a brief introduction. An industry expert is, is, is connected to us today. We are fortunate to have him with us. Mr. Vidit Patia is a data scientist at Adobe, working on building the next generation platform for data scientists to operationalize their services and intelligent services to help the marketers run their businesses. So it's a, it is a very brief and impressive profile of uh, the in the expert connected with us today. So I hand you, Mr. Vidit, please carry on with the session and share your industry experience with us. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. It's a, a chilly morning here. Uh, and uh, it's, it's getting worse every day. Uh, so um, I, I think two days back, uh, uh, the weather uh, department uh, reported that uh, November was one of the coldest months in the last 70 years and this is my first uh, 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 kind of winters in india since i returned from america last year and uh, uh, i'm experiencing it after like so many years so kind of I, I think you guys would be feeling very similar with the cold so uh, yeah just bear with me soon the sun would be out and things would get better uh, i would uh, want this session to be uh, as interactive as possible so if you guys want and you're comfortable uh, please uh, uh, switch on your cameras and uh, feel free to interrupt me uh, wherever you feel uh, that uh, you need to ask questions. Um, I'll give a brief introduction about myself. So uh, um, as uh, Nidhi uh, ma'am told that my name is Vizit Bhatia. I uh, have been working with Adobe for the last uh, uh, close to seven years. I was in uh, San Jose. Uh, I did my MS from Arizona State University in uh, social media mining and machine learning. Um, and uh, followed by my uh, job in um, Adobe for the last uh, six years. And then I took an internal transfer to NOIDA uh, last year in December. And uh, since then, I've been working at the NOIDA office. Um, my uh, major charter in Adobe is twofold. Uh, so I get like two kind, different kinds of exposure there. First, uh, I am a lead architect in uh, building a platform uh, which helps uh, host all the intelligent services that are hosted by Adobe today. And then also I'm involved in uh, development of intelligent services, which help uh, the marketeers uh, basically uh, uh, target uh, uh, their customers. Now, I'll give a little bit of introduction about uh, this side of the business of Adobe. So uh, you guys would have heard a lot about um, uh, Acrobat Reader, Photoshop, and Creative Cloud related products. Uh, but you might not have read about uh, offering from Adobe, which is called Marketing Cloud. It has approximately eight to nine solutions, and uh, they, they basically help uh, customers do analytics on clickstream data and uh, basically help them target uh, their customers for marketing purpose. And that's the BU business unit that I'm in. Uh, so my the data that I uh, work on uh, in day-to-day -day life deals with a lot of clickstream data. So for example, Nike is our customer, Marriott is our customer, T-Mobile is our customer, HTFC Bank is our customer, and uh, um, uh, Vistara Airlines is our customer, some of the Indian names. Uh, and, and basically what they use is that they have their websites which are built in, um, in, in products from Adobe uh, for say uh, Adobe Experience Manager, then which is tightly uh, tied to uh, Adobe Analytics. 
which is basically responsible for collecting the data as the customers uh, go around their website buying stuff or, or just browsing things uh, they basically use our analytics platform to collect all the data and then uh, there are services that can be used on that analytics platform uh, to basically target the customers by sending them emails or, or stuff like that that's a brief introduction uh, i would love to uh, talk more about this if anyone is interested but uh, yeah let me just give you i'm, I'm going to be with you uh, all the day today like three sessions and so the first session would be uh, basics of uh, machine learning and i saw a couple of uh, like i have the whole um, kind of uh, schedule but i'm not sure what has been covered or not so if you feel that uh, it's kind of naive and you guys know about it feel free to stop me there's a lot of material to cover so i can just move on uh, and um, i'll start with uh, an introduction to linear algebra then uh, statistics uh, that are required for machine learning then we will move towards a little bit towards some of the communities that are there outside uh, which you can basically join to take help uh, the, regarding data scientists. There are a lot of competitions that run, tutorials that are available, a community that can help you solve problems or understand things. Uh, followed by the second session, this would be the fundamental or, or a foundational block for the second session, which is around causal analysis. Now, causal analysis is a very different stream of uh, work, which I got involved about a year and a half ago, and is very different from the predictive kind of models that you build. Uh, and we'll talk in more detail uh, uh, what that exactly is. And then uh, recently, I started working on re reinforcement learning. Uh, my background is more in NLP, but uh, uh, because uh, I just wanted to make this more interesting and take you guys to cutting edge, so I thought that I would give a uh, talk on things which I am, I myself am learning, and you know, I'm, I'm, I just got into them. So yeah, I think it would be a interesting experience. And if you guys have anything to share with me, insights or any information that you have around these topics, feel free to uh, interrupt me, ask questions. And then let's keep this uh, session interactive. And of, co of course, again, if you guys are comfortable uh, sharing your uh, video, please feel free to open it up. Let's start with uh, sharing my screen now. OK, cool. Uh, one more thing, uh, Nidhi, for the second session and the third session, I want to share some uh, Jupyter Notebook books uh, with everyone what would be the best way to do that you write you can write on the chat window and uh, according know it, you can share the link on goes, the chat window and they will be doing okay. the needful okay i'll i'll put them on uh, google drive then in that case okay sure yeah and share the url okay so i'll start with just an introduction to linear algebra so uh, I, i'm sure that you guys would have gone through this uh, either in your you know education when you did your btech or or probably uh, later as well based on uh, what your background is and what your profile is right now but but i'll, I'll go through them because i'd say it's a good refresher to basically start with so uh, matrix addition we all know it's basically a fundamental thing that given to metrics you just do an any element wise operation and you add those metrics together and and believe me all these things are uh, the fundamentals of uh, you know deep learning or any of these things that we do so we'll, we'll get to it eventually then uh, yeah, it's basically then scalar time vector so basically given a vector a vector is something which has a uh, magnitude and uh, direction. And in, in terms of uh, uh, data science, uh, a scalar, a vector is basically considered something which is uh, which has more than one dimension. So like, for example, if you have a data set with, uh, suppose, n number of uh, uh, attributes uh, that are there and then one predicted um, kind of value, then in that case, those n attributes would represent the n dimensions. And then uh, this would be basically uh, a vector which would be in n dimensions. Uh, and then if you want, you can basically calculate the uh, magnitude as well as the direction of that. Uh, a vector and so a scalar time vector basically just increases the magnitude of the vector um, and then uh, product of two vectors there are three ways to multiply element by element inner product and outer product so element by element is basically just uh, we, we 
it's very similar to addition, but we do multiplication. Uh, then uh, uh, there is inner product in which we basically multiply the row with the, the column. Uh, and then there is a, a, a dot product which in which you basically take one vector and you multiply it with another vector. And then you try to basically see uh, the projection of one vector over another vector. And that's basically the multiplication. Now, uh, in, in linear uh, feed-forward networks, uh, the concept that is used is basically for a dot product. So basically what you do is that you have weights which are associated with each and every neuron. And then there is a value that is passed to each and every neuron. And so uh, once you basically try to take that uh, um, um, information through those neurons and then you try to basically calculate the final prediction result or something, uh, uh, you, you, you generally use uh, 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 inner product. And so basically, if there are uh, n attributes that you are basically trying to use, and then um, uh, you, you will pass those values to uh, each of these neurons, and then each of these neurons would have a weight associated with them. And that would basically uh, lead to uh, an inner product of both of these uh, weights and the attributes, which will give you the uh, output of uh, this operation and then you can basically add an activation or something like that um, on top of that to basically make it non-linear uh, then uh, the outer product is basically in which you uh, take the uh, column for the first one and the uh, row for the second one and uh, uh, this is also used in um, some uh, 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 machine learning algorithms, but very lightly used. Most of the time it is uh, inner product that we use. And then uh, matrix, uh, ma matrix times a vector is basically you take a vector and then you want to multiply uh, that uh, vector with a matrix that is given to you. Now, uh, what is important, it, it actually gives back a vector. Uh, and what, what, what it is uh, very important here is that you have to make sure that the uh, dim dimensions of the vector and the matrices are basically maintained. So like, for example, here, uh, the first uh, matrix is of size m by n, and then the second vector is of size n by n. So once you multiply them together, it will give you a, a vector of size m, m cross 1. And uh, this is used extensively when you are building very complex, uh, deep uh, neural networks, because the only way before uh, actually executing and doing backprop for uh, kind of uh, training, uh, the only way you basically make sure that your whole uh, network is correct is by making sure that the dimensions are consistent across the whole network. Then uh, it basically gives you a, just an interpretation of uh, the inner product, uh, how it is exactly done. Uh, and similarly, how the outer product in, uh, interpretation happens. So basically, you take the whole first uh, uh, column, then multiply it by the first element in the row, in the column of the uh, vector, and then you uh, basically get the first element in the column, which is uh, the uh, resultant uh, vector. And moving on, so rank of metrics. Uh, so rank of metrics is basically uh, nothing but which defines that. Uh, uh, so basically, uh, uh, it, it, this is a very important concept because it helps you basically define uh, the uh, relationship that uh, metrics have with uh, uh, the other matrices when you basically try to use them for uh, interpretation in neural networks. Now, uh, let's take a look at a two-layer linear network, and it basically will use all the concepts that we discussed uh, just now. So uh, in a two-layer uh, linear network, what would happen is that there will be a, 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 a layer, first layer, which would have neurons in it, and then a second layer, which would have neurons in it. Now, what happens generally is in the first layer, we would have the attributes that are being passed. And in the second layer to backprop, we would be training the network to uh, learn some weights, which would be initially uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, um, initialized with random weights. Uh, generally, it is used uh, a normal distribution with zero mean and uh, uh, 
uh, one standard deviation. And so once we are basically done with this, what you do to basically create the uh, output, uh, which is the y, uh, i, is by multiplying the weight matrix, which is basically captured at the second layer with the input that is coming from the first layer. Uh, this basically just gives more information around it, how you uh, do it for each and every one. So basically you will take the attribute that is coming from the first layer, multiply it with the whole, la la whole uh, layer, uh, basically whole uh, row, and then it will give you the output that is coming out from this particular neuron. Uh, and this is basically product of two matrices. So basically if you have a multi-layer uh, neural network, what would happen is that uh, the second layer and the third layer would basically be consisting of matrices for weight. And so the first layer, even though it would be a column vector, uh, the subsequent layer, uh, which would be basically outputting, would be a matrix, and then the matrices would need to be multiplied. And yeah, this basically continues with the same uh, concept of matrix multiplication, uh, outer product. And so yeah, a little bit about the matrix properties. So what is a diagonal matrix? I think this is uh, just a small refresher. Diagonal matrix is anything which has only uh, values at the diagonal and everything else is zero. Uh, and then identity matrix is something which has ones in the diagonal matrix. If you multiply a uh, matrix with identity matrix, the result is uh, the same matrix. Uh, then the inverse matrix is basically something that uh, if you multiply with uh, the matrix, you get uh, 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 identity uh, as the result uh, uh, and yeah for for the inverse to exist uh, the rank of the matrix would be one less than the dimension uh, so yeah this is a kind of a very uh, interesting concept that how does a matrix transform a square uh, so basically let's say that uh, there is a uh, uh, there are two uh, vectors that are given to you, which is basically a, a zero one vector, which has only uh, direction towards the y axis, and then uh, a one zero vector, which only have direction towards x axis. If you multiply it with a matrix, it would basically scale this square uh, based on uh, the matrix that is given here. And uh, the area would uh, generally uh, not change and it would basically be the determinant of uh, the particular matrix that you are using. Uh, and uh, so uh, this can also be used to uh, solve the algebraic equation AX equals to a lambda X, which is basically generally what we do for solving, uh, um, uh, you know, linear regression or linear classification related problems. Um, and uh, it basically just goes into the details of how you do it. Uh, now, eigenvectors and eigenvalues are kind of a little bit important. So uh, uh, what is an eigenvector and what is an eigenvalue? So suppose you take a matrix and you want to make sure that uh, there is a value which only just changes uh, the matrix uh, by uh, a scalar. Uh, and which which results in a, a similar matrix of the same rank, then that particular value, the scalar value is called the, called the eigenvalue of that matrix. Uh, so, uh, so like for example, uh, given this matrix M zero three two one, uh, and if you take a, a vector which is one one, uh, uh, what will happen is that. Uh, you can create a scalar, which is three, uh, which would only change this matrix by uh, the magnitude, which is basically converted from one, one to three, three, but the direction will is remain exactly same. So in this case, uh, one, one is caught. Was there a comment, a question? Okay. So one one is called the eigenvector of M and three in this case is basically the eigenvalue. And uh, well, well, in some cases there are uh, multiple uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues as well. Uh, and uh, that can be looked into. Uh, eigenvectors always obey this equation, uh, ME equals to lambda E and the properties are used in a lot of places. So like for example, PCA, uh, principal component analysis is completely based on the concept of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Uh, will not go in detail for that. 
Now, uh, after this introduction of uh, um, linear algebra, let's move a little bit towards statistics. So in statistics, the most one most very important thing that is kind of uh, comes into uh, picture is Bayes' theorem. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about Bayes' theorem because this is kind of very important and uh, uh, is used at multiple places. So uh, suppose we have give have we are given a data D and plus an initial knowledge of the distribution that that particular uh, D uh, data D follows. So like, for example, uh, we can uh, take a data D and then if we know that, okay, uh, the conjugate for the uh, uh, kind of uh, probability distribution that we want to fill in uh, is uh, the distribution that this particular uh, data D follows. And let's say that it is normal distribution. We can basically take from that distribution, try to, uh, as our prior, try to uh, change that distribution based on that data to, uh, and there are ways to do that and we will talk briefly about it. And then we can basically try to get the original distribution uh, of this particular data. Now that orig original distribution would be um, very in reference to the conjugate prior that we have taken, but it generally basically leads to a very good fitting of uh, what we want using Bayes' theorem. So some of the definitions here are very important. So basically uh, the prior probability of fetch is denoted by pH. It reflects any background knowledge we have about the change. So let's, uh, about the chance that H is the correct hypothesis. So basically what we will do is that we will take a, a probability distribution that we believe uh, would be what this particular uh, distribution uh, for this data would be following. Then uh, we will take a prior probability of D, the data that we feel that this particular uh, data would would be following the probability distribution. And then we will uh, basically uh, find out the conditional probability of observation. So what is the probability that P, uh, uh, the probability of the observing data D given uh, some world in which hypothesis H holds. And uh, then uh, we will basically try to create, uh, calculate the uh, posterior probability given the uh, other things that we just talked about. So it basically represents the probability that H holds given the observed training data. This is generally which, what we basically want to do. And uh, by this, what happens is that once we have this probability available, we can take any new row and given that row, we can try to see that what is the probability of this row happening. And that would be basically what our prediction would be. And Bayes' theorem help us compute pH given D, uh, given uh, P uh, data, given our hypothesis, probability of hypothesis and probability distribution of the data. So one way of solving this is basically using MLE, which is called maximum uh, likely, likelihood. Uh, so basically what, what we do is that, uh, let's say that uh, the likelihood uh, that we have is L uh, theta and theta here, uh, is basically uh, the set of uh, uh, variables that we have. And so uh, we will take the probability uh, of uh, our data happening given those variables as P, X, uh, um, uh, and then uh, we, will, we, we are just basically saying that X uh, being the representation of all the data, uh, whereas uh, X1 to Xn is basically all the rows that we have. And then uh, we will say we can convert this to uh, a multiplication of all these probabilities for each and every row. And then if we take, that's why it's called, uh, if we take a log likelihood of this, this multiplication, which is a little bit difficult to uh, basically uh, calculate, will be converted into a summation. And then what we are trying to say is that what will be the value of theta from all the different, uh, like from the whole space, of theta that we have so that we can uh, try to uh, maximize this uh, probability distribution that we have. And that would be basically the maximum likelihood theta that we would have. Uh, so there is an example that is for the cone tracing problem. So let's say that a coin has a probability P of taking heads and uh, one minus P of taking uh, tails. Uh, we toss a coin n times and the result is set of H and S. So H is basically heads and tails and there are 
uh, m h and uh, of course if we are doing n uh, times then n minus m tails uh, what is the value of p based on mle given the observation so we already have the observation so what we will do is we will take the log likelihood uh, of the probability that we had so log p raised to the power m and 1 minus p raised to the power n minus m and uh, because we are taking uh, log it will basically come down to m log p plus n minus m log 1 minus p uh, we are just basically uh, applying log on this so the um, powers goes into the front in multiplication and then uh, what we are basically doing is that we are uh, doing a a derivation a partial derivative on dp and once we do a partial derivative on dp we get uh, n by p minus n minus m upon 1 1 by 1 minus p so this is very uh, easy to do because um, the const the m and n minus m here would become constant because they are not dependent upon p and then uh, because there is log uh, the uh, uh, uh derivative of log is basically it goes into denominator and then on the second part because it's 1 minus p we will have to do a derivative of 1 minus p as well so minus p upon dp uh, minus dp upon dp would be negative and that's why there is a negative sign uh, to maximize this we all know that we basically put the derivative to a uh, zero and when we put the derivative to zero that's basically how we may try to maximize that variable and if we do that we will get p the value of p is m by n and that's basically correct so like for example if we take a coin and we toss it n times and we say that what is like uh, the probability of getting a heads if we got heads m times in those those n tosses it's basically m by n and so we use mle uh, to calculate the same vari variable uh, so this was a short uh, like in, uh, introduction to uh, bayes theorem now we will move a little bit to a little bit of time check okay we are well in time so uh, yeah uh, so basically uh, uh, just a brief introduction about uh, different type of uh, machine learning uh, stuff that we have so the first thing is basically uh, classical statistics so in the good old days what used to happen is that we used to have very small uh, data sets and what we used to do was a lot of uh, things were dependent upon counting so i'll give you an example of a very simple uh, classical statistics based machine learning problem so uh, let's say that uh, Uh, we have a class, and a class has fifty uh, students, and each one of them appeared for a, uh, you know, physics test, and they got, uh, you know, some results uh, in marks. And then what we what we want to do is that uh, if a new person would have uh, come in the, um, uh, it would have been there in this class, what uh, would be their uh, what would be the marks that that person would have got in physics right now to solve for this it's a very simple problem now uh, a very simplistic uh, solution could be that you take all the marks that the people the, all the students in that class would have got you average them out and then every time there is a prediction that is asked to you you can say that okay uh, this person would have get, would have got Uh, the average uh, number of uh, average marks that uh, was the average of that particular class uh, now uh, even though that would not, uh, if if that person would have given the exam in reality this number would have all been off with a certain uh, point uh, but it would still be uh, okay because the average of that class would be maintained at the average of the class would be maintained across a more tip, uh, complicated example to solve this problem would be that uh, we can uh, try to create uh, the mean and the standard deviation and then we can basically say that okay which generally is the case with numerical variables uh, this numerical variable follows a normal distribution and we fit the normal distribution and to uh, figure it out we basically uh, calculate the standard deviation and the mean and now every time there is a new student we basically try to uh, predict uh, by using this normal distribution we sample a number out of the normal distribution and we try to see that okay what would be the marks that this person would get now 
this of course if that person would have appeared for the test in reality uh, the marks would have been there would have been some error in these marks but still these marks uh, that we are going to like assign to that person by our prediction model would still not be off because it would uh, follow the uh, distribution that we assumed that uh, the set of students would have followed now over time what happened was that the data sets started being big, getting bigger and bigger and uh, also uh, we started getting computationally more and more uh, you know better with our better computers gpus and stuff so that's where a lot of machine learning started coming into picture and we started uh, moving uh, like further away from statistics based model and getting more into mathematical models which are which can handle mem like higher data and then uh, things like uh, you know gradient descent and all those things started coming into picture so now these are some other names of ml um, not required to be discussed uh, some of the applications of ml uh, search and recommendation automatic speech recognition text parsing face identification and so on and so forth uh, then uh, some of the tasks which are kind of very important that we should know about uh, so there is supervised le learning so supervised learning is basically something in which you try to uh, classify things uh, into into uh, some prediction variables so like for example uh, given uh, some images and uh, you want to basically figure out uh, you know whether it is a cat image or a dog image so you would be able to basically classify that image into uh, cat or dog or, or suppose given a text you want to classify whether this text is talking about sports or whether it is talking about um, say politics or whether it is talking about business or whether it is talking about education. Uh, so these are basically a very high level uh, supervised learning task. And generally what happens is that in these tasks, there is a set of attributes that are given to you and a prediction variable. Uh, and you basically try to use uh, choose from uh, a very various different kinds of uh, models that are available and then based on your problem and then you basically try to fit that model and you can use that uh, consistently for uh, trying to predict if you have new data coming in then there is uh, unsupervised learning now the problem with unsupervised learning is uh, that uh, you don't have uh, labels on the data and sometimes even if you have labels, it's called semi -super unsupervised or semi-supervised. Uh, the labels are not available extensively. So I'll give you an example here from uh, one of the pro projects that we did recently. Uh, so um, uh, imagine that there are people who are uh, visiting a Nike's website and they are basically just browsing. And what we want to do is that we want to figure out that what, who are the people that are visiting Nike websites who are similar in their behavior. Now, when we talk about behavior, this behavior is also pertaining to uh, online uh, you know, purchase or online uh, behavior uh, or pertaining to the Nike website. So there might be some people who would basically just come browse the Nike website, uh, try to you know, look at the products, but once they have to buy it, they would go uh, into a physical store. They will try to wear that shoe and that's when they will buy it. Then there will be other kind of people who would uh, basically know what exactly they want because they have tried a particular shoes for a certain number of years and then they want to just buy the exact same thing. So they will go uh, directly probably search for uh, that particular product on Google, go to that uh, you know page on Nike, uh, click purchase and uh, and then that's it uh, they will just get the product then there would be uh, a third group of people who would uh, not know exactly what they want they are visiting nike website for the first time they're just browsing and and that's where uh, most of the focus should be because the other two clusters we are okay to basically they, they will eventually uh, purchase from the nike website but uh, as a customer, Nike would be interested in, uh, you know, converting these people who are not really sure if they want to buy or not. Now, how can we make sure that we can, uh, you know, capture these people? So one way of doing this would be that suppose we have, you know, data around uh, these people. So 
some of the uh, things that would be uh, their profile related like what is the age of this person what is the gender of this person and uh, uh, you know uh, where what, what is the location that they are visiting from what is the device that they are using whether they are coming from a mac whether they are coming from an android device or they are using an ios device stuff like that Uh, and and general profile information then there will be behavioral information uh, that we would try to calculate so like for example what is the frequency of them visiting the website when was the last time that they purchased what kind of shoes that they are interested in are they interested in running shoes are they interested in training shoes are they interested in sport shoes just in general uh, and, and so on and so forth and then uh, with these variables that we have we would also try to capture uh, you know the labels around it okay so these people uh, went to the website and bought it uh, these people went to the website and later they went to the store and bought it and then a set of people who basically just lingered around and never bought now these are the three labels and we can convert it into a classification problem and then train a model uh, to uh, cl- uh, classify new people in one of these three buckets but generally this is kind of not possible so first of all uh, we don't know uh, generally the people who basically came on the website and you know they were looking for the products uh, and they later went to the, the store and uh, bought it so right, there is no way to reconcile these people together right and then also uh, uh, the other people uh, we don't know the people who were basically uh, trying to uh, you know move around in our website whether they really went to the store or bought it or not or either they went to the adidas website and bought some stuff or not so the putting so sometimes putting of these labels is very very difficult so basically this comes under the realm of uh, segmentation marketing segmentation so uh, the best way to basically deal with this problem would be use some complex algorithm uh, with some feature engineering to cluster these people together and then use those clusters to basically define uh, what this uh, new, if there is a new person coming into the nike website what kind of person this is uh, for this we use unsupervised learning so basically what we do is that we would go inside uh, with these uh, kind of uh, users and their attributes and we will try to run uh, one of the clustering algorithms and then we will try to see what are the major clusters that we have and then once we have those clusters we will try to analyze the clusters that what is the uh, pro- what are the properties of these particular clusters that are inherently forming in our uh, visitors from the website so we did a complete end to end project on this this is available as an offering to our marketer so basically what we do is that we uh, cal- collect all these users in our analytics platform uh, convert them uh, uh, you know like try to Uh, create some behavioral profile for them then create clusters out of it and then we explain those clusters to the customers now based on those explanations the customers can uh, retarget those users for some marketing activity or something like that uh, so that's basically what goes into unsupervised learning uh, there are some other things that goes into unsupervised learning like dimensionality reduction as well pca typical example of dimensionality reduction then also there is something called tsni which is used for dimensionality reduction in the embeddings that are learned from neural networks and then uh, feature at extraction uh, okay so we have a so dimensionality reduction uh, so basically uh, dimensionality reduction uh, can be thought of as uh, uh, reducing the dim- uh, dimensionality of our high dimensional data are uh, to something which is uh, like uh, a summarized uh, representation uh, which captures all the information that the original data like most of the information that the original data has but reducing the dimensions so like for example if you imagine in the world of uh, natural language processing uh, if you consider documents uh, each and every a word in the document can be considered as a dimension and thus uh, when we deal with uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know, documents in natural language uh, world uh, it's a, it's considered a very high dimension data so how can we make sure that we reduce the dimensionality and then this is just basically a one gram model where we are considering each and every word as a particular dimension now if we try to concatenate together two words together and or three words together and move to an n gram model 
there will be another dimensionality uh, explosion so how can we make sure that we are taking this information and representing it in a, a compact form so the example that they are given here is of an image so an image is basically 600 by 600 uh, pixels and uh, so the number of uh, uh, dimensions that are there is uh, 360000 um, and uh, so it would be very difficult to basically build a kind of models on such high dimensional data and uh, there are ways to basically do it so like for example you can also use pca uh, in uh, uh, image uh, dimensional tree reduction. So basically what PCA does is that it will try to basically figure out the most important uh, components in that particular image. And uh, PCA is generally used for uh, things which are basically um, uh, in, in, in metrics format. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, in, in metrics format. And then what you can do is that you can basically um, uh, reduce it down to two different uh, matrices. Uh, the first matrix is basically contains the uh, components. And then if you basically take what happens is that the uh, uh, first few components, two or three or maximum five would be able to, uh, you know, explain the uh, 95% or 98% variability in the data. And then you basically just take those components. So your uh, dimensionality will be reduced from 600 uh, by 600 to 600 cross five. And that's how, uh, that's a very typical way of doing it. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so like for example- me, Sir, I have a query yeah. here. Uh, sure. If you reduce the dimensionality, I mean, uh, the characteristics of that uh, won't be affected, right? Uh, yes, so basically what we try to do, like for example in PCA, and I can talk about some other dimensionality reduction techniques. So for example, in PCA, what we try to do is that we try to take the principal components and generally those principal components capture, uh, you know, 98% or 99% of the information uh, that we need in the data. And so we let go that 1% off uh, to basically save us from the, uh, uh, you know, the problems with uh, high dimensional data. Uh, to give an example of another uh, example is so like we create embeddings in NLP and uh, maybe I, I don't know if you guys have uh, or someone has gone through this, but there is a skip gram model which basically helps us to define, give a hundred dimension vector to each and every word. Uh, and, and that basically helps us to uh, reduce dimensionality. Now, if you take this matrix, which is suppose uh, 100 cross 100 for all the words that we have. And if you try to do PC on top of that, what we what, what is a general uh, observation is that in this case, PCA is not a very good way to uh, reduce dimensionality because you will have to still take like 75 to 80 percent of the components that are being uh, uh, you know got out of that metrics, uh, and 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 it's a it's not a very good way because PCA is most of the time linear, and in that case we generally try to take PCME for reduction. Now, why does uh, this uh, a PCA works very well for images? So if you see if you if you consider an image, and if you see that. In generally an image, multiple pixels across, the gradient is very, very small. So if you basically zoom into the image and try to look at the pixels, you will find that for a very long time, the uh, pixels would be very similar. So like, for example, if you take a nine cross nine image of uh, a letter like three, what you will find is that only uh, some of the pixels where three is coming is basically black or grayish in color, whereas the rest of the pixels are basically white. Now, all this information can be compacted together into just two or three uh, uh, components. And what would happen is that it will, the representation that we will get will represent that, okay, all the uh, area where we have white uh, color would be compacted together. And uh, the information where there is black would be compacted to that together. And the rest of the information can be discarded. Does that make sense? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so data representation is another area. So like, for example, if you see that this is an image which you want to represent uh, with data uh, and uh, our machine learning, even though our eyes can totally see that it's a kind of flat face with two eyes and a mouth, 
but our uh, machine learning algorithm is not uh, capable of doing this so we would basically try to represent it in this way so we'll call all the white spaces as one and then we will take all the black spaces as zero and then the grayish spaces as 0 0.5 now this is a typical example a very good uh, you know kind of candidate for pca and then again uh, this basically where we have uh, 130 handwritten threes which are generally uh, used for nms nms it data for uh, uh, prediction of what the character is in our particular image and so to represent this what we will do is that we will take uh, uh, all this uh, threes and we can represent it in a very uh, small uh, number of uh, components so like for example we can take the first component the second component and the third component and that's it that's all what we need uh, to represent this uh, so uh, this would basically capture all the information that is required uh, to represent uh, all these variables so like uh, this 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 would considerably decrease the uh, dimensionality of our data uh, and this basically represents images of faces mapped into embedding space so as you can see that uh, uh, this is basically we are converting uh, uh, these faces into embeddings so as you can see that different areas in this particular uh, graph represent uh, 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 different uh, expressions in the face so as you can see that this is a totally different uh, expression and this is a totally different expression but because these two expressions are uh, similar to each other then that's why they are closer to each other in the um, higher dimensional space in, in this uh, dimensionality reduced space and then uh, like things uh, the the faces which are very similar are actually placed closer to each other and the faces which are very different are uh, you know placed uh, like further away from each other and uh, uh, similarly this is uh, the word embeddings that i was talking to you about now uh this is kind of uh, uh, very uh, interesting so basically each word was initially represented by a high dimensional vector that counted the number of times it appeared in different encyclopedia articles like word with similar contexts are collocated now here what we saw is what we see is that uh, the um, i think this is i'm missing one slide here I can just go and look it up there for the embeddings. This is a very, uh, this is a traditional model in, uh, you know, using neural networks for uh, dimensionality reduction, but it's a very important uh, kind of, uh, uh, this one does not talk about it. So a very good information that comes out of this particular embeddings is that uh, if you take embeddings of queen, king, and uh, basically uh, embeddings is nothing but a vector which represents the word king. And then you take the representation of man, which is basically nothing but a vector which represents man learned from the embedding. And then you take a representation of women, uh, women from uh, the area of representation. And then you basically just take these, and because the embeddings are of uh, same dimension, so like say 100, uh, it will be three vectors of 100 dimension, 100 cross one, and you subtract man's uh, embeddings from it's an element wise subtraction you subtract man from king and then add women to the resultant vector the a vector that you will get would be very very close to the representation of queen um, i'm missing that slide from my slides that's basically what i was trying to uh, show here and uh, that is basically basically a very important uh, information because through this you are able to uh, capture uh, you know, the uh, semantic information inside that uh, you are basically able to capture that king is a male, uh, you know, leader and queen is a female leader. 
and man is basically just a male and then women is just a female so if you basically manipulate them in the vector space or uh, directly it gives you the vector of of the queen and uh, so this basically talks about the different features uh, and uh, glasses versus glasses beards versus no beards these are all ways of representation uh, so that we can uh, basically uh, feed them to uh, our machine learning algorithms so like for example here uh, what happened was that uh, um uh Uh, if you are basically taking the beards and non-bearded people, uh, and you are basically trying to do, do their representation, uh, that's how basically they would look like. And so this is the representation of the bearded people, and this is the representation of the non-bearded people. And this is again in a very similar context for glass versus non-glass. So this is basically uh, the representation of glass people, and this is the representation of non-glass people. So once you do the representation. Uh, it basically brings them down to a uh, distinct people uh, uh, in the in the uh, representation space so uh, what 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 is being tried to explain here is that the information that is important so what we are what we care about is basically whether the people have are wearing glasses or not that information is uh, consistently uh, being uh, you know kind of saved and so this is basically music similarity graph and uh, it basically shows that the musics which are uh, similar in nature are basically again uh, uh, grouped together so that information the semantic information is kind of basically being saved uh, yeah moving on to a brief introduction around reinforcement learning and we will go into details uh, uh, with with what what reinforcement learning in the third lecture today so basically uh why 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 is reinforcement learning considered separate from supervised and unsupervised learning because it's a totally different paradigm in some sense uh what happens is that there is a concept of uh what do we call it uh there is a concept of uh uh state space and rewards that comes into picture so there is nothing like a label so in in unsupervised learning after we have basically clustered or uh, brought people together at the end of the day what we basically try to do is that call the people into a cluster but in the case of reinforcement learning there is nothing like that happening there is no label that is ever generated and what happens is that there is an agent which goes into the world and tries to basically uh, perform act and based on those actions that it take it changes its state and every time it takes an action in a particular state it gets rewarded and by the virtue of that particular reward it learns so like for example Hello. it is sorry we just got disturbing i think yeah. your screen is not shared presently mm it says you are sharing your screen uh i'll, I'll share again just... one second So the complete view was not available. Can you guys see now? Yeah, it's better now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there is a uh, so so you get rewarded, and then uh, the agent gets rewarded, and based on that reward, uh, the agent basically changes the uh, kind of uh, state mm -hmm. and action representation that it has. Um, Uh, so like just just like a uh, way human beings learn and uh, the way uh, in which animals learn so like for example if you want to teach your dog to uh, you know sit uh, and every time what you can do is that when you give them them the action to sit if they sit you can give them a treat and if they don't sit you can basically shout at them or something like that and then eventually they would know what to do and that's basically the concept of reinforcement learning and it is different from considered different from supervised and uh, unsupervised learning then there is a concept of uh, semi supervised learning and what happens is that in semi supervised learning we have uh, you know some labels available but most of the time the labels are uh, you know missing and what we can do is that there are different ways like for example we can use graph based discretization are uh, to infer the missing labels uh 
uh, in semi supervised learning and uh, um, so like for example what you can try to do is that uh, in this example as it is shown that you can try to basically uh, learn the manifold structure so what it is believed is that uh, the higher uh, the the higher dimension data lives generally in a lower manifold and once you try to basically bring it down to the lower manifold it still retains the underlying structure that it has and uh, you can basically try to do that and then you can try to uh, understand based on similar uh, data points that what would be the label for this particular um, uh, data point and that's basically what semi supervised learning deals in uh yeah a little bit about uh, communities so I, i specifically want to introduce you to uh, two different uh, places where you can run your I, i i'm hearing some background noise so people if you're not talking if you can please mute yourself that would be great so the first one which is kind of important is uh, okay kagal so basically after this particular Uh, AICT course is complete. You might want to go probably take some courses in Coursera or something like that, and uh, you might want to basically uh, take a look at uh, um, 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 those courses. And once you are done with with them, you might want to basically explore your community uh, beyond just you know learning from courses or these uh, conferences. and you might want to start you know um, um collaborating with other people competing on data science problems and stuff like that and uh, uh, also uh, um uh, uh, you might want to get some hardware where you can basically execute your programs so uh, generally getting a gpu for learning basically your uh, deep learning based models or Uh, stuff like that is kind of very uh, difficult and is very expensive so for that there are two places which i generally go and i want to introduce you to them so one is kaggle so um, i would uh, uh, kind of encourage everyone to basically go on to your browsers and search uh, for kaggle and uh, uh, basically this is uh, uh um, what you see once you get here and this is really really interesting because there are a lot of uh, uh you know um people who are uh, available here and this is very similar to stack overflow for data scientists there are different uh, kind of uh, competitions going on so like for example if you go to compete you will see that there are a lot of competitions that are going on so uh so like for example NFL big data ball 2021 uh hu uh, um uh, bmap hacking the kidney uh, kaggle ml and ds survey and then uh, mm, digit recognizer right which is the traditional mni mnist data and and so on and so forth so you can basically go to uh, one of these and uh, you can see that there is an explanation here then there is data around it uh then there are some notebooks which basically shows you how to start exploring the data which is uh, you know given by the community and then you can try to basically create notebook now if you win this if you basically go here and try to win this particular competition so you can go and see the leaderboard as well so at this point of time this guy whose team's name is amble there are two teams they are doing the best with a score of 0.890 they have tried 53 uh Uh, times and then the last entry was three minutes ago. Whoever wins this competition is gonna get this prize money of fifteen thousand uh, dollars, and uh, uh, yeah, something like that. You can join the competition. You can talk to these people. You can also see their uh, you know kind of uh, uh, contributions. So, like for example, if you go here, uh, you can see the notebooks that is being created by these people. I think this one is by the author itself. Uh, which basically explains you uh, what the data is and uh, what are the uh, things that you will be using for analysis something like that at a very high level and you can basically read and start playing around now the good thing about this is that um, uh, once you start getting into it you will get hands on experience and and it is kind of important now another thing which actually is kind of important here is that 
it. You can use this for, uh, uh, you know, you can you can use this for creating your own notebooks. So what happens is that uh, you can uh, try to, if you want to learn something or you want to, uh, you know, run something on your own, you can just go and click on new notebook. And uh, I would encourage all of you to please go and, you know, log in and try to create an account here. So it's basically creating a whole, uh, you know, server at the back so that you can basically start running your code here. And this is free, totally free of course, you don't have to pay anything. So you're getting uh, uh, a 19.6 GB of disk uh, and then a CPU and 16 GB of RAM, which is uh, not even the configuration in typical laptops that you buy today. So generally the laptops that you buy outside are 8 GB. And for a 16 GB machine, you'll have to pay somewhere you know, around 80 to 90 lakh, 80 to 90 thousand or a lakh. And uh, so uh, you can get it for free. In fact, if you want, you can also uh, use an accelerator and you can say that I want to use GPU. Now the GPU is uh, limited to 48, 42 hours this week. Uh, and uh, I have 41 hours remaining. Uh, and quarterly sits weekly with minimum uh, 30 hours provided. So like for example, every, uh, uh, week this quota would uh, reset so you can use the GPUs for running your computation for 42 hours every week and this is all free of cost right so you just click on turn on GPU uh, and your uh, draft will restart and you can basically start writing GPU based uh, code uh, uh, and, and, and run it uh, using TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever uh, the tool that you like to use and uh, once the session is up and running it will show you uh, that there is a GPU available that you can use. And this GPU is like uh, a good one, uh, probably a P100 or something like that because it has 15.9 GB memory available. Now, if you want, you can also use a TPU as an accelerator. Uh, and TPUs are basically tensor uh, processing unit, which are uh, from Google and they are even better for learning deep learning uh, models. I generally don't, uh, use TPUs. I have never got to a uh, you know use case where I had to use TPUs, but GPUs are uh, like generally good enough. And then you can just go and write uh, um, any uh, you know code here. So like for example, uh, and then you can. I'm sure that you would have used uh, Jupyter Notebook in the past, and this uh, is very similar to uh, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, So you can basically write your Python code here and execute stuff on the fly. So Kaggle is a very good uh, community for you guys to be in. Uh, there is forums as well here uh, that you can use for discussions. So based on what you want to do in, so like for example, if you want to talk something about computer vision, you can go here. If you want to talk about something related to data visualization, you can go here. People would ask questions and uh, you can basically uh, learn from other people what they have done in the past and 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 so on and so forth uh, then there are some courses here as well if you want to take so and and then of course you get all the uh, other things for free for example uh, the execution environment is free and then the community support and everything is free so you can take these courses as well so i would uh, say that uh, this is kind of uh, a very good uh, uh, community to be in uh, and I would encourage everyone to basically go and uh, you know create a registration now. So I'll wait for uh, two, three minutes for you guys to go and uh, create the um, registration here. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, meanwhile, you can ask. Hello, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, sir, may I know the difference between uh, dimensionality reduction and feature extraction? So uh, that's a that's a good question. So, like for example, uh, so dimensionality reduction is generally done uh, at a level where you 
are hundred percent sure that you know you have some information that you can let go. So, like for example, uh, in the case of PCA, and there is an image, and uh, you are uh, you know that your images are very similar in uh, you know a sense uh, along some pixels. You can do a PC on that, and you will try to reduce the dimensionality of that particular. Uh, image to like three or four dimensions. Now in feature extraction, it is slightly different. So you can and and they go kind of hand in hand. But in the case of feature extraction, you can imagine that a deep learning model or any model per se would not be able to understand uh, you know uh, a word in a NLP context, right? So like for example, if I say um, a quick brown fox jumped uh, over a uh, you know a quick brown fox jumps over a, a greedy dog, but you you will not, and if you pass this to a machine learning model, it will not understand uh, the uh, uh, you know like the meaning of these words. So at this point, what you try to do is that you try to extract the features out of these words so that the machine learning model can understand. And once you try to do those feature extraction, you do in context of a particular. Uh, you know, a use case that you are trying to do. So, like for example, if you are doing trying to do entity recognition, uh, it would be uh, very different as compared to if you are basically trying to uh, classify your, uh, you know, documents in different uh, groups. So like for example, you are trying to see that if this uh, document is of topic A or topic B or topic C. So, in both the cases, the feature extraction would be very different. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, Ishan, good question. So, we'll we'll cover this question in the third session, which is uh, 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 specifically on reinforcement learning. Uh, and also, just to let you know that uh, uh, this actually uh, uh, reinforcement learning is slightly different because what we believe is that the environment is completely observed, uh, MDP and partially observable MDP. Uh, this comes from more of a traditional planning kind of area where what we will do is that uh, the agent would basically go and try to look at the environment and try to basically plan the execution way before uh, it basically goes in. But we'll talk about this in detail once he goes to the reinforcement learning uh, in the third session today. Okay, so moving on from Kaggle, uh, there is any any more questions? Yeah, I'm sure that this was a more of a refresher for you guys. If you guys are here, you would have already taken some courses and uh, linear algebra and very simplistic um, like kind of uh, statistics would be clear to you. That's why I rushed through everything. So uh, Google Collab, now this is another platform Hello, sir. One question, sir. Yeah. Sir, sir what is Markov decision process? So, uh, so Markov decision process is basically uh, something in which we have uh, some states, and uh, what we believe is that uh, the so it's like a, a finite automata in some sense, and what we believe is that uh, the uh, you, this agent would be basically transiting from uh, this particular a state diagram by uh, making some decisions in each and every state place. We will, we will talk about this in detail in the reinforcement learning uh, chapter again, once we get there. Yes. Okay. So moving on to Google Collab. Uh, so this is basically another place which basically gives you, and we will be using both Kaggle and Google Collab in our uh, next two sessions. So moving on to uh, Google Collab. So this is another place where I use Google Collab way more than uh, Kaggle. So as you can see that there are a lot of uh, notebooks that I have created here. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, uh, this, this basically, this is a basic uh, notebook which gives you an introduction to what is collaboratory. And uh, you can use this for, again, uh, uh, uploading your uh, uh, notebooks and uh, executing your code. So like, for example, uh, let me just open. Sir, you need to share your screen also. Oh, I haven't.
Okay. So uh, basically, uh, if I want to open one of the notebooks, so basically, if you see that this is uh, one of the notebooks that I already have, and you can uh, try to uh, basically write code then uh, so it, it also gives you you know the hardware that is required to run your code for free uh, so if you just click on connect it will basically create a, a um, you know kind of uh, it will go to gcp and uh, get you a machine uh, through which you can basically execute your uh, code and uh, as soon as it will be initialized so now you can see that this one has uh, your RAM and disk is allocated. You can see there is an active session here, uh, which is re uh, related to this one. And uh, uh, the amount of disk and RAM that is given here and the CPU is very similar to Kaggle. But uh, if you go to edit and you go to notebook settings and you change the hardware accelerator to GPU, you get a GPU and there is no upper limit on how many hours that you can use this GPU for. So you can totally uh, use this GPU for um, uh, as much as you want for running your code and that should be okay. Uh, so this is just basically uh, some code that I wrote in TensorFlow uh, for uh, uh, some statistical model that I was uh, building a few days ago. And I use this extensively, Google Collab. So I will uh, encourage all of you to basically uh, use this uh, because it gives you free hardware and free GPU. We're gonna use this today for our causal analysis, uh, you know, workshop, and we will be getting there for, uh, you know, running some of our notebooks. Uh, I think I and one more thing, uh, if you guys want, you can follow me on Medium. I uh, keep on, uh, you know, posting uh, some stories of my own sometimes, as as and when I get time, uh, I'll paste the. Link in the chat pod. And so this would be uh, another thing. And so there are the, the guide that I'm showing you. Uh, this one, the notebook uh, has been uh, is basically what I wrote the blog on. So feel free to uh, follow me there and then uh, tune, stay tuned for uh, more content as I create. And so, yeah, Google Collab is basically something that you should totally go and check it out and uh, try to run your workloads. So whatever you are learning from here, if there is workshop or anything that you want to execute and you don't have a machine which is as powerful, uh, you can totally go here, get a GPU and basically, or, or even without the GPU with uh, good enough RAM, you can try to run your workloads. And uh, it's, it's quite performant. And I think that's uh, all that I have for uh, this session if you guys have questions we can i can take some but the second uh, lecture is quite heavy so i can basically start with that so that we should be able to complete it in one and a half hours and nidhi what do you think we can utilize the next 15 minutes for that yes it's your choice so we have 15 minutes here to go for the session Okay. okay cool so i will uh, yeah i will go with the causal inference one uh, okay so this is basically okay there's some problem with the images give me one second If you wish, we can rejoin after twenty. We can we do. Ah, uh, sorry, Nidhi. If you wish, we can join at uh, twelve o'clock. Yes, only uh, about fifteen minutes are left. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's reconvene. Actually, I was thinking that if I can give a little bit of uh, introduction because this is a uh, kind of a big session. I don't understand why the images are not showing i will i will take a look at the presentation and yeah let's let's meet back at uh, 12, 12 o'clock 
yeah okay. thanks guys thank you very much for the very good session and new informative knowledge shared with the participants thank you with it yeah thanks so thank you participants uh, the attendance link has been shared you can uh, fill up the attendance and we rejoin at 12 there will be no updations on of the attendance on atal portal presently but after the end of the session a complete fdp within one week the attendance will be updated so do uh, someone has written the query that atal portal is not showing any attendance that task is to be done after the fdp is over so thank you all